All right, let me just check if this podcast is going. We're going to go for an hour. And in this hour, I hope to cover as much as I can of this book, uh, Strategic strategic Play. Let me just check if the pod- podcast is on. Just checking my phone to see if the podcast is playing here now. Yes, it seems to be live. Okay, let's do this. <coughs> let's make it so I can see the chat too, hopefully. Okay. All right, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, let's start. So, what does it say here? I already read, I skimmed this part of it. It talks about him being super impressed by Nimzovich's book, My System. And it talks about how there's no complete system of knowledge uh, for positional play, but he hopes to lay, lay out in this next game um, some directions for exploration of this theme of positional play. And that, uh, yeah, okay, let's let's go, let's do this. So first he gives this game where apparently he's going to present us with various themes of positional play that we can go deeper into. So let's, let's do this. Yeah, in this game, there are no complicated variations or spectacular combinations. Uh, the strict logic of a positional battle also has its inherent beauty. Okay, let's, let's do this. C4, G6. <clears throat> I see three, so an English opening here. Uh, G3. I used to play this as white, and I played this with black as well. Bishop G2, E5, D3, Knight C6, E3. Okay, this E3 move is is a uh, is a bit weird to me. Makes sense, and I might play it in the future myself. I like it, but usually I used to play E4, the bot bot mimic system. Okay, Knight G7, uh, Knight G2. Castles, castles, and we have bishop e6. So it seems black is trying to do this sort of thing. Uh, and knight d5. So I've seen this idea before. I actually went through Mihail Marin's book on the English and talks about this kind of idea where now when black tries to go queen d7, which he does, now black will have to shepherd this pawn. So bishop e6, h3 is not possible. Trade, trade, and then c7 is hanging. Although then I'm curious, like, and I guess knight cannot take because pawn takes and forks these two. Bishop doesn't want to take because then he's trading bishop for a knight. So knight d5 is kind of untouchable. Okay, so what does it say? Otherwise, black would have played d5. It subsequently pressed along the d-file on the weak d3 pawn, right? Because he played e3. d3 is weak. And so let's let's put that to the test. He's saying black was going to play d5 otherwise. So if I played a move like e3, is d5 really coming? One, two, three. Three defenders and one, two, three attackers. So yes, black could have done this. And then yes, the d3 pawn. Whoops, d3, d3 pawn becomes really weak. Right. Okay. So that's why White played d knight d5 there. So right, these are like kind of the deeper strategic ideas that I, I generally don't even think about. So it's good to expose myself to this. Okay, queen d7, and rook b1. <clears throat> it says White's flexible development scheme is. One of the best against the king's Indian defense. Yeah, I like it too. Uh, okay. Um, pieces are harmoniously deployed behind pawns, right? Okay. Okay, the two sides' subsequent plans are largely dictated by the pawn formation. Black, thanks to his pawn at e5, has more space on the king's side. And yeah, so he's going to play f5, g5, even f4, which is always scary. But it says white can neutralize this with f4 himself. Something which I actually like love to do as white is play f4 in these positions to stop that kind of kingside stuff. And it says he himself, white, will attack on the queen side. Of course, b4, b5 is coming. That's why he played rook b1. And then uh, by advancing his pawn to b5, it'll kick out the knight on c6 and intensify this pressure exerted by the bishop. Okay. If black wishes to push back the knight from d5 by playing c6 himself, white will... O- it open up the B file by exchanging the spawn. Right, the rook's already on B1. Uh, and then bring out his bishop to A3. Okay, this is new to me. And then bring out his bishop to A3 and his queen to A4. Interesting, okay. Taking out of account that there's clearly no point in developing his bishop at D2 in the opening. Okay, see now, that's a deeper idea here. Like, anybody would just play bishop D2. Even I m- might consider this. But he doesn't do it because the real strategic deployment of the pieces is to go B5 and then go bishop A3 next. 
as, uh, like if black plays c6 to kick out the knight on d5, then there's pressure along this diagonal. <clears throat> it would be advantageous for the opponent to exchange the strong g to bishop. Without its support, the offense yeah, largely devalued. In addition, the position of the white king is weakened, but bishop h3 will not do well. Right, because c7 is hanging. Uh, right, because of course, in view of. Yeah, knight takes e7. Okay, but now imagine the black king's right? It's not on e7, but at f6 or h6. Then bishop h3 would be possible since. Holy crap, what is this? What is this? It's saying if this knight wasn't on e7, if it was on f6 or uh, or h6, then black could go bishop h3 because then if bishop takes h3, queen takes h3, and if knight c7, then uh, knight hops into g4. And let me checkmate on f2 or on h2. Okay, let's learn something. Okay. Uh, this means this simple tactical motif suggests to Black the idea of slightly changing the arrangement of his forces in the opening, right? So this knight, in hindsight, might not be the best place. It would be better placed on these squares from where it can attack. Then bishop h3 would be possible in that position. Okay. And he's saying he himself preferred to develop knight f6, for example. Knight g2, Gaskal, yeah. And we get this position here. And in this position, <clears throat> it's saying uh, rook b1 is now harmless. In view of bishop h3, right? In the event of knight ec3, you have uh, the reply bishop h3 would now be inactive. Wait, so it's saying instead of rook b1 in this picture, if he played knight knight ec3, then bishop h3 wouldn't work. Why is that? Because uh, then knight takes f6. Oh, right. If, because then knight f6, then uh, bishop takes, then knight d5, and I'm hitting the bishop. And now I take the bishop on h3, queen takes, and knight takes c7. Is that it? Bishop d8. No, so if I'm hitting the bishop, bishop has to go to d8. Then bishop d2 takes, takes f5, queen b3, better chance for white. I don't know. Mm, let's, actually, let's, let's go through this. Let's put this on the board. If instead of knight e7, if you went knight f6 here, let's just follow this variation, put it on the board. Uh, knight g2. Castles, castles, bishop e6, knight d5, and queen d7. Okay, now if rook b1, it's saying bishop h3 is now uh, possible. And this is the line he was giving, like it takes, queen takes. White thinks he's being smart taking there, but then knight g4 seals the deal. Black wins. However, if instead of rook b1, white set up this trap, knight c3, then here, this is different because now we take intermezzo. Put the knight on d5, now we're threatening this again. Knight takes e7, but of course black would play bishop d8. Now what does it say? What would white do here? Then uh, bishop d2, queen, uh, bishop takes, king takes, f5, and it's a queen b3, and white has better chances. Now I'm, I'm not sure if I agree with this. Let's see. Why is, why is why does white have better chances? I guess f4 might come. And can black play f4 himself? Takes, takes, knight takes, no. That's probably why. Uh, yeah, anyways, okay. B3. Uh, it says first stronger is 10, knight e8 on move 10. So instead of bishop h3, knight e8 is strong. Right, so not allowing this trade. Now you have superfluous knights here. <clears throat> yeah, now bishop h3 is going to be a threat. And, uh, and, now, and also knight d8 followed by c6 is a threat. Uh, knight on d5 feels uncomfortable. Right, the c3 knight is occupying the square. It would like to withdraw too. Uh, yeah, the superfluous piece. I've read about this. Okay, let's keep going here. Uh, it says r3 is above several times tried. It's knight to h6. This plan has its logic. Okay. So now he gives a game where Yusupov developed his knights to h6. Kind of to circumvent some of the ideas we talked about here, so let's quickly go through this. Uh, we have c4, uh, e5, knight c3, knight c6, g3, g6, g2, bishop g7, e3, g6, g2, knight c6. Right, so developing the knight here instead this time. Rook b1, and now it says this is a dubious move. Okay, a5, a3. Bishop e6, knight d5. It says d3 was sounder. Okay. Castles. 
castles, queen d7, <clears throat> b4, and uh, bishop h3. And you see the idea here. You would think white can take and then uh, take on c7, but then knight g4 to follow. And in this line, uh, there's no knight takes f6 kind of thing we looked at earlier. So here, d3, bishop g2 takes, and then uh, f5, f4, question mark. So this is important to me because I would have flashed out with f4 myself as well. So now I'm curious, why is it giving this a question mark? It says e4 was better. Okay, this gets a botanic system kind of position. And of course, there's enough control over f4 here. So that's not really a threat. Interesting. So f4. This is question mark. Why? <clears throat> okay, a takes b4. a takes gf4. Oh, what? No. What the heck is good? Did I, did I miss a move or something? What's going on here? So strange. A B four A E takes F four. Okay, I see. And then G takes F four, right? Uh knight E seven. I'm still waiting for the point of like why F four had a question mark attached to it. Knight D C three. King H eight. Queen B three. Knight G four. Bishop D two. Queen E six. What what is this? Why is he giving up C seven? What is going on here? No, I must be missing some kind of move. Oh, because he went knight d c three here back here. Knight d c three. I don't know why, but okay. King h eight. Queen b three. Knight g four. Bishop d two. Queen e six. Rook f three. C six. H three. Knight f six. Rook f two. Knight h5, what's going on here? Knight g1, h6, and knight f3, g5, uh, fg5, hg, knight g5, queen h6. Okay, so what was, what was my kind of conclusion here? Like, I won't go through all of it. Maybe I will, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll go back through it and then, like, try to find, like, a conclusion to draw from this. Okay, so queen h6, knight f3. It says uh, if h4, then knight g6, right? h4 becomes really weak. So he comes back. Rook g8. So black is sacked upon, but look at the white king. King f1. Uh, knight g6. Knight e1. King e1. f4. Uh, okay, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop going through this here. Um, and just try to draw a conclusion from this. Like it said f4 was, was a mistake. And I think it's because um, after e takes e takes uh, this pawn didn't want to take. I think because then d four is weak. Maybe. Well, I'm not even sure about that honestly. But uh, with the knight on h six, like uh, e three becomes weak, kind of maybe. So, anyways, after g g pawn took, then black played king h eight, and then it said about g h six and g five was it? Yeah. Uh, Oops. Yeah, we got this kind of thing happening. G5, and then uh, White's king was destroyed here. So I think that's could be why. So that's something to watch out for when I play f4. Although I'm not sure why in certain line, you know, lines it works, and other lines it doesn't work. But okay, let's keep going here. So back here, uh, what does it say? Instead of rook b1, preferable is castle, castle. Okay, where? What is that even referring to? Move 7. Rook b1. Here it says better is castles, castles, and d3, and e, bishop e6. No idea why. Yeah, we get this kind of position. Why is it saying that? It says in the game, Hort versus Kovacevic. What? Kovacevic? Why gave his Let's change the light. So then knight d5, e7, rook b1, knight bishop h3. B4, bishop takes g2, king takes knight d8, this c6 idea, right? B5, c6, and so black's chances are already better. Hmm. Okay, so it probably makes sense to prevent the exchange of bishops. Oops. And what position? This position? 
Okay, so after knight d5, queen d7, rook b1, bishop h3, b4 takes, king takes, knight d8, b5, c6. Back, okay, I already went through what the I already went through is. It probably makes sense to prevent the exchange of bishops with h3, it says. So I'm guessing back here. Move 9. Yeah, move 9 h3. It says exclamation mark. Instead of knight d5, play h3. Uh, that to prevent the exchange of bishops. Now there's king h2. So queen d7, king h2. f5, and then b3. Rook okay, e8, and then d4. Here are two practical examples. Okay, so now if f4, then we have d5. f3, d6. Rook e Wait, rook e6. Shit. I think the knight's on a h6 or something. Shit. It's the knight h6 uh, line. Here. In this line. Okay, knight h6. Then I guess uh, something like this. If it's saying h3 here is better. I think. Queen 7 King h2. Uh, f. Was it? F5? And then uh, b3, okay, rook e8, this is the game, yeah, d4, f4, it says dubious, why? Okay, d5, because he miscalculated something, so f3, takes, queen, rook has to take, she takes, rook takes. So what happened there? I lost a pawn and black lost a pawn, so we should be equal in material. So why is it saying black, it uh, made him, it was that was dubious move, why? Then we have knight e4. Threatening knight g5 or knight c5, right, because of this pin. Uh, then we have rook back to e8, king g2, rook f8, bishop a3, f5. I don't know, white just seems super solid here. Let's see, seven, rook a d1. White has the obvious advantage, I agree. I mean, c5 is probably even coming. Yeah, just super, super solid. So that means that h3 was the way to play. It says, it says avoiding the trade of. Although somehow, yeah, okay, h3. It's just more solid, it seems. In f4, there's enough control. I actually like it when white doesn't play e4 against King's Indian and keeps this kind of structure because you have a lot more control over the f4 square. And yeah, I just really like that better. Okay, so another game after uh, b4. Okay, we looked at f4, which was a dubious move. That happened one game. And then another game, let's try bishop f7. Okay, so then we had d5, d5. Knight takes e5. Bishop b2, g5. It seems like black is really stretching. Oh, or, or it gives it an uh, exclam. Interesting. Black intends g4 or bishop h5. Amazing. Uh, then f4, right? Natural reaction. And then knight e g4. Holy shit. Because the knight's coming there after hg4, knight g4, king g1, but he doesn't even take it. He goes first, queen e6. I guess he can take it later, but still. I think the real idea is he's going this way. So now white would have to... Let's see if I can figure out what, what my white might play here. Uh, how would I defend this if I was white? I have no idea, man. Maybe I would go take an f4. Let's see here. Now he goes queen d2. I guess this is not the end of the world because I just move, move the rook aside somewhere, maybe. Well, okay. So he goes queen takes. Then we had uh, queen takes, and rook takes e three. I don't know why. Okay, followed by rook f e eight with a complicated and apparently roughly equal position. All right. So black did better in this game. I like this g five idea. Okay. Uh, and and this, that sack was interesting, G, uh, knight g4 after that, because you would think f4 would just shut everything down. Okay, so going back here. In this last game, black coped successfully. This, okay, why is black can get pooped? Instead of bishop b2. So here. Instead of bishop b2 here, I think. Uh, instead of 14, bishop b2. Yes. He should have, for the moment, kept the bishop on the c1, h6 diagonal by playing rook b, b1. Uh, why is that? I don't know. 
Oh, because it, it guards e3. In that last line, after g5 and this knight sack, after f4, e3 became super weak. Although, whatever, okay, so b1. Another tempting idea is and on move 8, b3. So instead of d3, you play b3 here. And again, this is keeping this fortified. Yeah, and he, and he saves the tempo by pushing the pawn to d4 in one go, rather than playing d3 first. Uh, okay, let's search. Okay, so what this what this whole analysis taught me is like there's a deeper level to opening preparation, or even like just thinking about the middle game even. Uh, like when you put when I look at moves in the engine, it, it gives the similar evaluations to these moves like d3, b3, whatever, h3, and I don't really know the, the reasons why, but only until you see like some ensuing games, the uh, continuations from the positions, then you realize okay the ideas behind the moves. So like we saw one game where there was this bishop h3 idea, and after you trade, queen ends up here, and the knight comes to g4. So then it makes you understand okay. Uh, and this knight c7 idea, and then putting the knight on h6 instead of f6 so that there's no knight takes f6, so that now it makes sense to why you're putting the knight on h6. It makes sense why you would play h3 and king h2 to avoid the trade of bishops. Uh, now I have the f4 idea, and then I saw that even after the f4 idea and uh, g5, white can still come under pressure if e3 is weak after d3, so then maybe you would want to improve like this. Like There's a deeper level to, to the game. So let's return to the setup of the knight on e7, the original game. No, he didn't go h6 here. He went even e7. Where's that game with the knight on e7? There we go. Promote this variation. Okay, good. Knight e7. Move. Okay. And we got to which position here? Knight d8. Okay, instead of bishop h3, knight d8 is the move. So why not bishop h3? Because here there's a knight uh, c7 threat. So knight d8 is played. So you play c6. But then I read earlier in the book, remember that white wants to go b4 and b5 so that on c6 he gets to trade and open b5. So I'm guessing b4 is the move. Uh, what did he play in here? On move 11, he played, right, he played b4. But let's go back here. It says, sometimes black tries a5, it's a knight d8. Um, but to him, it says it runs contrary to the well-known positional principle where you don't move pawns on the side of the board where you're weaker. Because this leads to the opening of the a file. Now, interestingly, that's the move I would lash out with as black. But now, after reading this, I might reconsider this in the future. You don't push pawns where you're weaker. Uh, because the opening of the a-fall, it says, will most probably favor white, because it's he who is dominant on the queen side. So that changes my ideas about this. I would have previously been happy to open the a-file with my rook there. Um, but okay, now I changed my mind. Okay. Now, a5, okay. And then uh, white would go a3. Uh, and then rook a e8 was played. Dubious, it says. There followed b takes b4 a takes a takes uh, knight d8 b5 c6 so now you see the b5 opening up b takes b6 knight e7 e7 sorry no uh, rook e7 and and now it asks how would you now have continued this is the exercise and so I'm guessing the answers are in the back so I'll have to check it later maybe okay so let let me think about this exercise here how would we continue as white this is it's important to do these puzzles, okay. So I'm guessing rook b6 is a candidate move. Uh, how would I continue here as white? Uh, so white's gonna, black's gonna play f5 probably. f4 takes, takes. Oh, that should be okay. So one idea is to play queen a4, and then rook b6, and uh, if black tries d5, um, so 
So d4 is interesting as well, but then bishop takes c4. So I would try queen a4. Although then I'm worried about d5. No, not really. If d5, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking this variation right here. If queen a4, uh, I was worried about d5, but I don't think it works because takes, takes here. Uh, you can really make this pawn weak, I think, uh, with, let's say, No, this is not working. No. Okay. So I'm not sure what white should play here. D5. Oh, but you have you have bishop a3. I just saw that. Okay, so he cannot play uh, d5. And if he cannot play d5, then this is coming under some serious pressure. Like, let's say f5, rook b6. Although then, then I'd be curious if I even want to take the pawn. But there is definitely is a lot of pressure. I don't know if I want to touch that pawn even. Like if f4, it's not working yet because I have this. There's no f4 yet. Yeah. Okay, so I wonder where the answers to the exercises are. Uh, hopefully I'll come, come across it later. Okay, so let's go back to the game here. Move 11, b4. Hopefully this is even the position. No, this is not. He played knight d8. Uh, how did this go? He went knight d8 here. And we had b4, c uh, Okay, and then he goes knight takes d5. Now I'm curious why he didn't just play c c6 here, and I'm guessing it's because of knight takes, queen takes, and b5. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So back here, he took here. Then we had uh, c takes. Okay, yeah, actually, the book says c6, the knight. That gives the variation here. If c6 takes takes b5, queen d7, he takes c6, b c6, and bishop a3. And it says white had followed by queen a4, and then queen a6, and it says white has an easy game. Now it says his opponent, instead of doing this, instead of playing c6, he traded here. And his, he did this, so his idea is to play bishop h3, but the concession he makes, uh, the book says, is the c file is now open for white. So yeah, so c takes. So black does succeed in doing this. Okay, then e4. So now that the bishop's going to get traded off, this makes a lot of sense. He put the pawns in the white squares. Now white's plan switches to playing on the c file. So typical play, only the dark squared bishops are left on the board, which means, yeah, white ranges his pawns in light squares. Okay, in order to open the diagonal for his, uh, for his bishop, his dark squared bishop now, to fix his pawns on the squares of the same color as bishop. So by playing e4, he's fixed black's pawns on the same color as this bishop, making it, making it shuttered in, and then this bishop is now open. Okay, so e4 takes and takes f5, f3, right? Just putting all the pawns on white squares, just shutting this down. I'll even play g4. Let's see. It says white's position is preferable. Preferable. Controls more space you can attack on the queen side. Yeah, this attack is not too dangerous, it says. Uh, Black's bishop can be classified as bad. In the event of c6, white replies knight c3, and then prepares the exchange upon c6 in order to play uh, in order to play b5 and gain the d5 square for his knight. Huh. If black desires he can play his knight to d4. But these squares are not equivalent. White is attacking the d4 square with this bishop, right? So white can even trade it off. Whereas bishop is not able to exchange his bishop for white's knight once it lands on the d5. Right, okay. So we get knight f7. And here's another question, another quiz here. Like, what should white play here? Uh, let's think about this. What should white play here? See, in a real game, I'd be tempted to play f4. But then, uh, having read all the stuff about shutting in Black's bishop, now I'm not even sure. So I'm thinking... And if you played b5, Black would play b6. And then uh, you're just banking everything on the c file, so I'm not sure about that.
So I think after knight f7, black is going to play bishop h6 and trade off the dark squared bishop, and I need to stop that somehow. But I don't think it's possible. So yeah, I don't know. I think just queen c2 or something. Or, I don't know. Yeah, probably queen c2. Okay, let's keep going. So it says the following move of mine was probably the best in the game. In order to find it, a chain of reasoning was required. Amazing. Okay, so I'm curious what he played now. It says, what does black want? He will most probably play bishop h6. Yeah, I got that. Should I agree to the exchange of bishops? Charlie speak. Okay. But avoiding the exchange involves a loss of time. The white's rooks will be deprived of the importance of c1 square and black. Yeah. Knight will go to g5. Dangerously threatening his king. So that it will be necessary to exchange the bishop, bishops. But on which square? Okay, so I'm really thinking f4 is the move. Uh, I eschewed it on dogmatic terms, but I think f4. But let's see. On which square? The opponent can be allowed to take on c1. Yeah. Okay, so he would rather take the bishop on h6 so that the knight ends up there instead of there, he's saying. It is clear that any bishop is, was a pure waste of time, right? Because it's going to get traded off anyway, so don't move the bishop. Uh, it says useful to play b5, but then after a6, the opening of the a file causes white a certain amount of discomfort. It's better for him to complete his development, tying the opponent to the... Uh, well, he played rook b3. Rook b3 was the move here. I wonder why. Tying the opponent to the defense of the backward c7 form. Why needs to prepare the tripling of his heavy pieces on the c-file. Yeah, and when you do that, usually the rooks, the queen is behind the rook, right? So it says, the piece to occupy c1 will probably be the king's rook, right? The place for the other rook is c3, and the queen will be deployed behind it on c2. Your general rule operates. On an open file, a rook should stand in front and behind it the queen, right? So this means that it remains to make a choice between queen b3 and queen c2. Okay, so queen c2 is my first obvious candidate. Uh, he chose rook b3. Okay. I think, but both work. They both achieve the same thing, although I did not have this idea of putting rook on c3. So he says he thinks it's his best move in the game, rook b3. Uh... So he's just going to pile up everything on the c-file, triple down it, he's saying. It says the rook move is the most accurate, so even more than queen c2. Why is that? That's a follow-up. Okay, but... He's saying it's more accurate than queen c2 because the queen might want to go to c1. This bishop's going to get traded off on h6 anyways. Okay. Okay, so now black will defend his pawn by rook c8. White will advance his queen side pawns on a, a, a to a4 and then b4, b5. But this will not bring him any immediate gains. Let us remember how we usually mount a pawn attack on the queen's flex. Yeah, if the pawn stands on g6 and then h4, h5. So I think he's talking about hooks here. But the uh, pawn on h6 usually go g4, g5. So it's a hook, right? Yeah, when we're making a pawn storm, we can use an advanced hook. So black has not created any hooks yet. So we need to kind of draw him out to make a hook. If it, if there is no hook, such hook, it should be created. Then the pawn storm will grow sharply in strength. So now the following maneuver of the white queen becomes understandable. This is after... Uh, I think I missed some moves. There. So let's play out some moves here. So after rook p3, what did he play? Uh... Okay, so he's saying move 16. If he had h6, this is an example game. Rook c3. Knight g5, question mark. It says c6. It was better, right? Just because he's going to have to deal with this start anyways. Okay, so knight g5, bishop takes. Pawn takes. Uh, queen c1, hitting this and hitting this. Right, black is already losing something here. Loss of a pawn is now inevitable. f 4 so now that kind of tells you in hindsight like the value of using the rook first instead of putting the queen on c2 because the queen ended up going here after all. Okay, so fe4, d4, g4, rook c7, g5, 
f3, rook f3, queen b5, c4, queen this part is not so important, knight g1. So, and white subsequently converted his advantage. Okay, so going back here, that was one game. Dvoretsky versus Kramnitsky. Now in this game, he didn't fall for the even play knight g5, blundering into bishop queen c1. He played bishop h6 instead, more sensible. Then we take, and he's saying he'd rather have the knight capturing here than over here. That's why he uh, didn't move the bishop. He was ready to trade on h6. Knight takes, and now rook c3. Uh, threatening queen c1, right? Hitting both the knight and here. These are power power balance squares. Here. Weaknesses, okay. It says, if knight c f7 would be a mistake due to, due to queen c2, rook a c and right rook a c1, and black has nothing to guard that again with. It's just bad for black here. Black is toast already. Amazing how powerful this whole thing is. So rook c3. He goes rook f7, so that he can put three defenders on this. Right, if he had played knight f7, then it would block the path of the rook to come here to guard this. Okay. Now, queen c2 and rook c1 can be played. Black will defend his pawn by rook c8. White will advance his queen side pawns with a4 and b5 and not bring it immediately. Right, this now he talks about making the hook. How, how does he make the hook? Then he goes queen c1. So this is, uh, he has to play king g7. Yep. And queen a3. a6. And so he created the hook now. So white really baited him in, in a very subtle way because he knows black wants to move the rook out somewhere. It's useless there. So he's really provoking him into playing H a6 that frees up the rook. But then white has created the hook and then b5 will come force. Okay. So queen a3, a6. Yeah, the rook is... Okay. Rook fc1 was threatened. So it's actually even more than that. After queen a3, he's threatening rook, rook c1. And that's so a6 was played because the rook wants to go to c8, but now he's created the hook. Queen b3, right? Now he's free to use the hook. Uh, he just wants to break break apart the queen side. Uh, it says after a takes, he will take with the queen, transposing into a favorable endgame. That makes sense. And he says he could have gone to a5 with the queen. To do the same thing, uh, but he did not want to go too far away from the king side because he knows an attack is coming there. So he puts on b3s where it's still kind of accessible, he can access the king side. Okay, now we get g5, right? So black is getting desperate, full on king side attack. But it says this is the decisive strategic mistake. Black's pieces are badly placed and therefore nothing comes of his planned attack. But what should he have played? Uh, there was the principle of the worst piece in a lecture. Uh, so move your worst piece to a better square. I'm guessing the worst place piece is the knight. Uh, so black's yes. So black should have played knight g8 instead of g5. It's saying, and then knight f6, and if necessary, defend right. He can go knight e8 to defend c7. That makes sense. Uh, then there's another idea, which is a slightly riskier idea. It says, which is to have played queen b5, followed by queen b6. Well. Right, it threatens to invade at e3. But how, on the other hand, they come under attack by the white pawns. Right. What's going on here? Thank you. Hey, thanks. Hey, buddy. Hey, Goxel. Nice to see you. All right. So how should white continue, it says. So in this position, he played uh, g5, which it says is a decisive strategic mistake. So let's think about why this is and how do we punish it. Uh... So obviously it's not taking because knight gets in here. It's like that's not it. Uh, so now if you played rook c1, there's rook c8. Has to be played forced. I'm also wondering if d4 now is really powerful. If this takes, this knight is brutal on uh, d4. So d4. Uh, the problem is Tim, me taking, if he doesn't do anything, doesn't bring me that, although it kind of does. So I'm, I'm really tempted to play d4, and I wonder, but then takes, 
takes, and uh, this is not so good for me here. Queen comes into h3. That's not good. So now I cannot play d4 yet. So probably rook c1. Uh, rook c8. And now I'm wondering d4. Takes, takes. Queen g4. Also is not good. But still, so I think rook c1, rook c8, and then maybe play a4, b5. So uh, an f4. Is f4 any good now that the king is wide open? Maybe. Let's see. Takes by a okay f four no that cannot be so good uh, I really want to play d four to get my rook across okay so hold on whoops no uh, so you played f four how does this go so let's say. If takes there, this is not working. So no, uh, not playing f4, not playing d4. So I'm just going with rook c1 and uh, a4, b5 idea. And here, are there any threats? g4. I can just play f4, so I'm okay there. So okay, let's go on here. What is? Let's look at his analysis. An effective procedure against a flak attack is usually a center blow. In the center. Yeah, but here d4 doesn't work. It says because uh, after f4, black opens the f. Yeah, gets g4 squares for his queen. That's why I abandoned this. Uh, but then it says it's uh, always useful to begin with. What does my opponent want? Obviously, he's intending g4 or f4. Uh, now, after g4, we have the very strong reply f4. Uh, I believe this was my response as well, because yeah, it just activates all of white's pieces, right? And again, yeah, black's own pieces are blocked. Like on g4, it's occupied by a pawn now. So g4 is not a threat, because f4 will meet it. And after f4, okay, actually, here I didn't think, because if we play g4, there's a sack here. Uh... And that, I think, black will get enough counterplay for a draw, at least. So I should have been, been prophylactic against uh, f4. I, I missed that. So I wonder if... Um, I can't play h3, because then g4, there's no f4. He takes. Is it, h4 is not a move. How do I deal with f4? I think I'd have to move the knight somewhere. Just because, okay, so if, let's say I move the knight somewhere. Then I'm thinking, now f4, I can play this. And the sack doesn't do as much. Hold on, no, that's that's brutal. That doesn't work at all. So how do I deal with this? Let's see his analysis. Right, after f4, we would love to reply g4, it says, but then obviously there's a knight sack on g4, okay. To avoid this, it is sufficient to choose the prophylactic h3. But in principle, this move is undesirable since it contra yeah, you don't move the pawns on the part of the board where you are weaker. If possible, it is better to get by without it. Perhaps promote the principle of economy of force and defense. Make the minimal concessions. Well, the move h3 is undoubtedly a concession, right? Does white have to make it? The f5, f4 advance also has a serious drawback. It removes the attack on the d4 pawn. Huh. Then I can go d4, I guess? Let's see. Uh, right, and then white would play d4, allowing the third rank to open. Right, so that means it transpires black is not threatening anything serious, which means that there is time to make a planned move on the queen side. So a4 was the move, right? And he, and after f4, he said he's playing d4. Because now there's no attack on the e4 pawn, so black cannot open this up. And so now d4 is perfectly timed. g4, wow, he's, okay, this I did not anticipate. That's, that's brutal. So white better have had a response for this. I'm guessing we just... Yeah, now... Okay, so I mean, what, what did white have in, have in plan for this? Uh, G4. Okay, first of all, it says if F, G3, H, G3, and G4, then of course F4 we go. That makes sense. So now after G4, he goes D takes E5. <laughs> And he plus d5, and then he goes 
g takes f4. This king is getting wide open. What is going on here? The exchange of pawns allows the white knight to move to e6. Here will be colossally strong. That makes sense. But okay, so he goes, he takes f4. And knight d4. Okay, this way. But my question is back here. Why did he have to take back here? Why couldn't he just go here? But I'm get, I guess he just goes there and, he's, and white's doing really well. This doesn't do anything. <clears throat> so this is the kind of move that would have scared me in a real game. And would have made me do something stupid to try and stop it, like h3 or something. But the uh, Grandmasters, they've calculated this out accurately. Then they know g4. They've got a uh, good defense against it. It's not doesn't scare them. So knight d4, king h8. <clears throat> Slightly better was g takes f3, it says. When white has a pleasant choice between rook takes f3 or king h1. Okay. So he goes king h8, knight e6. Now white's just dominating c6. Um, still, this is scary stuff. How do I deal with this? I'm guessing like rook d3 or something. What does he play? He goes... Okay, the game is almost over. After this, I'll stop for today. We've already gone for an hour almost. So he goes queen b2. Okay, I'm setting this up. Good technique. It says black king's forced to go to g8. Uh, which deprives him of any hopes of using the g file for a counterattack. He was going to play this. Um, right, and now the white will be the one to occupy the g file, if anything. So king g8, b5. The triumph of his opening plan of an offensive on the queen side. Opponent's defense collapse. Defense collapse. A takes. A takes. G takes f3. King takes f3. Now white is the one who's going to use the g file. Knight f5. What the heck kind of move is this? It says this is desperation. Now why? Okay, because he wants to play queen takes d5. So that's actually pretty strong stuff. man. How do I deal with this? I'm guessing I'm forced to take it. Queen takes take there no then he takes there that's brutal and knight said what the heck do i do here knight's actually covering this i'm throwing i'm saying we just throw in the check first yeah he does he throws in the check this covers a lot more squares you know then he goes knight g7 no that's that's a cop out but i guess he can't go to h8 so yeah rook g1 just solves everything uh it kind of forces the something the knight to just intercept otherwise knight f5 is a is a pretty strong move but he, now he's forced to go back. Then b takes, b takes, rook c2. Turning rook cg2, right? That is c takes d5. Uh, what the heck's going on here? Okay, that is on move 35, it says. After c takes d5. Wait, that's move 34. What is going on here? Am I move be Oh, shit. I think I'm going to move behind there. Oh, man, what's going on? I'm to go back and find... Okay, here we go. So I missed a move in here somewhere. Knight g7 on move 33. Whereas mine's on move 32. Shit. What move did I miss? Whatever. Whatever. We'll, we'll skip ahead here. I don't know what's going on. C takes d5. Rook c8. I don't know. Let's keep going. Who knows? Rook c2. Shit. So I'm, I'm actually missing a move somewhere, but uh, it's okay. I'll try and catch up later. I'll try and find the move later. So he goes rook e8. With the last faint hope of rook cg2, then uh, rook takes e6. <clears throat> and I guess the queen is still trying to enter in here. Yeah. But he decided to go into a rook ending with two extra pawns. Although, of course, a simple rook takes c6 was equally. Uh, so after rook e8, he could have just taken. So black is sitting a trap after rook cg2. Here and here. But white could have just taken uh, uh, here, it says. That would have been simple enough. But he, he does something else here. He goes. And uh, he goes rook takes g7. Oh, so he, he just wants to trade off everything. Like absolutely everything. And then just get into a rook endgame up two pawns. This will this will drop. Just liquidates completely. So rook takes, queen takes, queen takes, knight takes, king takes, and then uh although he didn't do king takes, did he? He went. Okay. 
see I'm, I'm actually lost here but okay anyways I'll, I'm probably missing a move somewhere but uh this yeah I can see why white would be winning here he did something else black or something anyways I didn't quite catch the end of that game because I missed a move somewhere but it's fine I got, I got what I needed out of this game so what this game taught me oh it's always good to recapitulate after a lesson so you actually retain stuff uh, is is the deeper level of analysis in the opening and middle game. Um, so for example, and I got some nice ideas, like this kind of position, <coughs> this kind of a tabia, like uh, has been played many, many times. I've played this with both colors, uh, probably well in the future as well, but there are some, gave me the nuances behind moves, like whether you develop the knight here, here, or here, stuff like that. This knight d8 idea with c6 to kick out the knight on d5, a lot of these nuances it let me understand so now when i do my own opening prep in the future in other lines i'll be able to kind of uh, uh get uh kind of nail down some ideas behind the moves by looking at how the games have proceeded like he did right in this chapter what did he do he gave uh, about four or five different games which i actually went through like this is an example and by going through that game you see how white can improve or, or one of the colors can improve like maybe we saw that in this position here, after queen d7, black is suffering because he cannot play bishop h3. Let, like, let's say I play uh, rook b1, then takes, takes, queen takes, and knight takes c7, right? So black cannot play that. So then black went back, went back to the drawing board, and started developing the knight to uh, f6 instead. So we looked at this. And the venom in this idea is now after rook b1, black can play bishop h3 because takes, queen takes, and after knight c7, knight g4 is winning. Okay, so then, then white goes back to the drawing board. If this is happening, then he thinks, okay, let's not play rook b1. And let's play um, what was suggested, uh, h3, right? Back here, instead of knight d5, white plays h3, I, I think, or one in one of these positions, uh, h3, so that we play king h2, avoiding the trade of bishops. And then black goes to the drawing board, and uh, Yusupov was developing the knight to h6 in uh, some of these positions. And then uh, they also thought, okay, instead of playing d3 and then d4 is coming later anyways, let's just play e3. And and then uh, d4 comes in one go. Like there's a lot of these uh, moves which the engine would just say zero. It's like they all have the same evaluation or slightly differ. You can only make sense of them by going through the games in the database. Then you see why some moves are chosen over others as the strategy plays out. So enough of that. We got an hour in today. Uh, how many pages did I make it through? Just to motivate myself here so this book is 116 times 2 so 332 pages long and we went through actually there's a nice recap here let's go through this and then i'll be on move um on on page page 18 or 19 so it's just pretty good for one day going through 19 pages of a book and so let's go to the recap very quickly here it says, after complete our, completing our analysis of the game, uh, let us return to the question of the various directions in positional improvement. So we have positional operations. Okay. Yeah. All right. Simple positional operations pursuing immediate and clear-cut strategic aims. Three main types of such operations can be distinguished. Improving the placing of the pieces, maneuvers, regroupings. For example, White prepared the doubling or tripling of his heavy pieces on the C-file. He had to decide where to keep his queen a5 or b3. He kept it on b3 to be closer to the king's side attack. Transferred his knight to e6. So maneuver of the rook to g2. Black made a strategic mistake. We refrained from the maneuver. Knight h8, f6. h6 to g8 to f6. Right, so these, these are schematic. This is schematic thinking. I've gone to another manual where they call it schematic thinking, where you have kind of these uh, few move piece operations, these maneuvers. And these plans are kind of your whatever. Okay. Number two, play with the pawns. The creation of a favorable pawn formation. It's like the hook we create, I guess. Uh, why it's fenced on the queen side. Opponent's pawn storm on the opposite side of the board. And the ways of pairing it. Yeah, I like the move f4 or meeting f4 with d4. Yeah. Okay. And number three, exchanges. Uh, right. So, like exchanging dark sword bishops. He knew it was coming, so he just avoided moving it out. And then he trades on h6 so that the knight ends up on h6 instead of g5. Uh, the opening position. 
yeah, putting knight f6 and c7, black carries out the bat to h6 exchange of light squared bishops and devastate by the exchange of knights, which white parried with the, with the idea of h3 and king g2. Okay. How are operations may be aimed? Also, oh, reversing the opponent's position. Yeah, so like provoking the hook. That was interesting. The move queen b2 was nice. Yeah, made the king go to g8 so that black didn't, couldn't double up, couldn't put his rook on the g file. Uh, positional operations, oh, threads out of which the fabric of the game is woven. This skill can and should be constantly trained. Exactly like cognitive vision by solving comparatively simple exercises, which do not demand a great delving into the position or detailed calculation variations. Interesting. Which now makes me think I should go through Agard's book, positional play, whatever. Okay, evaluation of a position. <laughs> Plan in the above game, or the black's plan proved to be a failure. The attack on the king's side. So a plan is a general course of art play over quite a over a quite lengthy period of the game. These plans are only of a guiding nature. Right, so he's talking about how white's plan could have changed if black had deviated somewhere. So they're only of a guiding nature. Like if black had played c6, then white's plan would have shifted to just playing b5. The hook is already there. Plays b5 and trades it and opens up the b file. And if after b5 black had played c5, then right, white would be trying to get the knight to d5, which would be a different plan. And then, and then white would probably even play on the king side with the f4 or d4 in their center here. So plans are also what we call shorter ideas. Sometimes it's just one or two positional operations. Uh, so like white trying to triple up on the C file. Right, and uh, black should have tried to improve the position of his badly placed knight on h6 via g8 to f6. Prophylaxis, okay. So he's laying out different positional directions, like different uh, subcategories. How you would improve your positional play so we we went through um one was positional operations so like improving the placing of the pieces playing with the pawns creating a favorable pawn formation number three is exchanges those are all positional operations then the next category is prophylaxis <clears throat> okay we, most of us know what prophylactic thinking is by now and then uh then we have typical positions okay says it's very useful to select positions with similar arrangements of pawns and pieces and in order to study the rules that operate in them. So the game we have analyzed is quite a good textbook example of a Sicilian setup. A similar structure arises, right? So he's saying uh, uh, examine these similar structures together to get the ideas in them. So this, what white played here, you get a similar structure in if you're black against the King's Indian attack or the closed variation of Sicilian defense. That's something I would want to do eventually too. Like, uh, there are certain structures which I'm not good at playing. It says, um, there were many points at which either side could have uh, deviated. Like black could very early on have just played f5 or h5, like interjected those moves at any point. And at, at that point, if, if we had tried to analyze all those possibilities, we would just be doing an opening exploration. So he's saying the study of many typical positions, like for example, this kind of uh, reverse Sicilian thing that we just looked at, is closely linked with the study of the opening. Thus, there are typical positions, or like, I guess, tabias. Uh, it's useful to study them. Okay. Typical situations, right? General character. The rules operating are of a general nature. Okay. Huh. 
principle of Vikant economy of force when defending. Right, that was that move h3. Like what white really wanted to avoid h3 because you don't you don't push pawns where you're weak. And you want to use an economy of defense. Like you don't make moves unless you have to. Technique, the pawn. Uh white did not have any problem in exploiting its advantage. Like if I had been playing white, I would have succumbed to black's king side attack. But white handled it really nicely, like that move queen b2, making the king go to g8, so there's no rook g rook g8. Connections with ten tactics and dynamics. <sighs> right, there are underlying tactical motives, mo motives, uh, motives, even behind positional decisions. For example, the choice between rook b three and queen c two. Right, he had that queen c c c one double attack. Uh, initiative. That's another another positional uh, direction. The initiative. That's another kind of sub top sub category. Now this is actually a new interesting point to me. Uh, the initiative. Sometimes I look look at open games and I think this initiative is is going nowhere. Like if you look at it with the engine, the initiative is lost after very is after very accurate play from the other side. But here it says uh, the initiative is an advantage, not just a purely chess advantage, but it can also be a psychological one. And so like when you you're really pressing your opponent, they can make more mistakes. They're not going to play perfectly accurate. Critical moments. Uh, so it says, in the course of a game, experienced players fairly quickly and easily find the majority of their positional moves, right? But sometimes the solution is not very obvious, and those are your critical moments. Uh, okay. Yeah, you cannot think for a long time over every move, so you need to be able to sense the critical moments. I think that's something I want to work at. Uh, some some moves just come automatically to me, like and just play them, and then maybe at like five points in the game, you have these critical moments when you identify them, and then you take more time. So it says, and perhaps the most difficult decision for White was the move rook b three, because he had to consider Black's plan, which is of course bishop h six, uh, trading on c one and playing knight g five. So in this book, he's going to cover a lot of these kind of critical moments. Uh, and then a difficult decision is the transformation of position. I actually have a struggle with that. Uh, sometimes one advantage has to give way to another. Um, so like when he liquidated on G7, he liquidated a whole bunch of stuff to go into winning endgame. Yeah, that's a transformation of an advantage. Okay, that's enough for today. We did an hour, maybe even a little bit more. That was good. Uh, we went through 19, 18 pages. Move eight, uh, page 19 of a 332-page book, so not bad. Thanks, guys.